Are the concerns about cyanocobalamin exaggerated? Hi, I'm Chris Masterjohn, and I have a PhD in nutritional sciences. I am not a medical doctor, and nothing contained in this episode may be construed as medical or nutritional advice of any kind or a substitute, therefore. This episode is meant purely as scientific education. If you wish to act on any ideas presented in this episode, please consult your physician first and never take anything herein as a reason to contradict medical advice. With that said, enjoy the episode. All right, Thalia Charney says, do you feel that the so-called dangers of cyanocobalamin have been exaggerated for the purposes of marketing active forms of B12? It has a long history of safety and there is no established upper limit. Do we have evidence showing how much of it is converted to the active forms? Are there people with issues converting it? I've not heard of any. Or is there just much we still don't know? I would love your opinions on the matter generally and references to any studies, resources you can you think I can read to better understand the nuances. Um, Thalia, so I, I'm not sure what people have said about the dangers. I know that I have been a critic of cyanocobalamin relative to other forms of B12, um, and I'm, and then it, you know other people may have used something I said to um, maybe not, maybe in an exaggerated way, and then there might be just many much marketing that I haven't actually been exposed to, um, where people have come up with their own marketing claims around other forms of B12, uh, but so my my opinion is basically as follows: uh, number one. The, the amount of cyanide that would be released from taking even high doses of cyanocobalamin is very small. And so I don't think taking cyanocobalamin is dangerous in any context that I can think of. So that's number one. But number two, one of our mechanisms for detoxifying cyanide, and it's not the only mechanism, but it's one of the key mechanisms, is to join the cyanide to cobalamin to pee it out in the urine. And so you may have cyanide from, you know, the most common exposure to cyanide is from vegetables and from cigarettes. And so if you smoke cigarettes or you eat vegetables, you're going to have some cyanide released and there's going to be a number of different ways of detoxifying it. One of those is going to be to join to the B12 and have the B12 carry it into the urine. And so I've always been skeptical that B12 um, from cyanocobalamin would have the same bioavailability as B12 from hydroxycobalamin or methylcobalamin or deoxyadenosylcobalamin or food. And so, and by the way, you know, I, I also have kind of a bias towards saying, well, Vitamin B12 in food is found mainly as hydroxycobalamin and deoxyadenosylcobalamin in meat, and it's found mainly as hydroxycobalamin and methylcobalamin in milk. And so if we don't know the answer to something, I think it makes sense to have a preference for those if there's no other reason to not have that preference. And of course, you know, the main reason to not have that preference is Number one, cyanocobalamin is cheaper. And number two, because cyanocobalamin is cheaper, cyanocobalamin is, is more prevalent and more available in more supplements than the others. Um, so from a cost-effective perspective, you know, I, I think if you did a cost analysis on how much does the B12 cost and what's the bioavailability, you would probably conclude that you can just raise the dose of B12 a little bit higher and any bioavailability is going to be smoothed out over the course of uh, maybe a longer period of time that it might take you to build your stores up at most or something like that. Um, but I just, you know, I think you're going to absorb a certain amount of the B12 and you are not going to retain as much B12 would be my suspicion based on everything I just said when you're using cyanocobalamin. And so um, probably it's going to take longer to, to improve your stores over time um, compared to taking hydroxycobalamin, for example. But uh, I, I doubt you can just 
compensate for that effect with the dose in an acute setting because um, the effect really isn't on absorption. It's really on retention in the body. And so, you know, probably you take a given amount of B12 and you sort of achieve a maximal absorption of it. Um, well, actually, that's not really true. So if you use very high doses, you do have kind of, I don't know if it's unlimited, but it's for all practical purposes, it's essentially unlimited passive absorption of a very small percentage of the dose. So you probably could get a very, um, you, you probably could compensate for the total absorbed. And I don't know what those fractions are, but let's say you double, um, let's say you double the dose and you have half the retention, and I'm just making these numbers up out of thin air, then you would, you would essentially compensate for that. Uh, uh, what I'll say is that I believe what the research suggests, and there's not much of it, is that cyanocobalamin will reverse a B12 deficiency, but at least over the, t- over the period of time of a few weeks where it's been compared to other forms of B12, and from memory, I believe it was hydroxycobalamin, uh, there is a better increase in plasma or serum B12 levels with hydroxycobalamin over cyanocobalamin. And so I'll make a note to post that study in the show notes. And um, and I think that answers your question. Uh, okay, Thalia, thank you for your question. This episode was part of a Q&A for members of the CMJ Masterpass, a buyer's club with exclusive and massive discounts on your favorite premium foods and health products, including pasture-raised and wild meat and seafood, supplements, sleep accessories, water filters, phototherapy devices, and much more. As a bonus, you also get to participate in monthly private Zoom Q&As with me. You can join the Masterpass at chrismasterjohnphd.com slash masterpass and use the code q and spelled out as Q-A-N-D-A, Q&A, for a 10% lifetime discount. For the remainder of 2020, I will be working full-time on finishing my Vitamins and Minerals 101 book while reserving a portion of my time for consulting clients. You can pre-order my book at chrismasterjohnphd.com slash book. In my consulting, I am neither a medical practitioner nor a coach. I serve as your data analyst and your strategist. I teach you scientific principles of health and wellness, help you analyze your data, and help brainstorm actionable strategies. You can sign up for a consultation at chrismasterjohnphd.com slash consultations. I will try to respond to comments here when I can, but my presence will be intermittent while I'm finishing my book. I hope you enjoyed this, and I will see you in the next episode.